Are you ready for the word? I see some people clapping out there. Yeah, they're ready. Well, let's do this. We're going to pray and then get right into the word. Father God, you are so good. And we thank you for this opportunity now to, to hear and to share your word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, that you would guide me by your spirit and that your Holy Spirit would teach us what you desire we learn, Lord. But not only teach us, but empower us and give us the courage to implement what we discover, to put into practice your word. We're thanking you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I am uh, starting this. I don't know if it's going to be a series yet or not. I'm just really trying to be led by the Spirit of God during this time. Uh, and the title of our message today is Reconciliation, What Can I Do? Now, we know that many of us are still impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I found out recently that in some areas, the, uh, the cases are still rising. And so uh, that's still a major issue in our country today. Uh, some, um, some places, uh, some states have begun to go into uh, the phases of reopening again. And some are in phase one, some are in phase two. And I, I heard uh, recently my wife, she had to do some traveling because uh, a death in the family, actually a home going, praise God. But she was saying she had a chance to eat in a restaurant, you know, here in California where we are, you can't dine in yet. And she said she went to a restaurant last night and enjoyed just that, that eating experience in public, right? But she also said, and these people didn't have masks or anything. They were just kind of living life. And I say, okay, well, keep yourself safe, sweetie. But see, there's, there's different phases of opening, reopening. Uh, and then on top of that, we still have uh, those that are protesting for justice, right? They're, they're, they're wanting to see something happen uh, as a result of the uh, injustice that has happened primarily to African-American uh, people, but, but injustice overall, right? And so they're keeping the momentum on lawmakers. Uh, they're protesting in the streets. Uh, and, and in fact, even in Seattle, they have what's called an autonomous zone. Some of you may have found out what an autonomous zone is. I didn't know what an autonomous zone was, but I found out what it is. It's a, it's a police-free zone where there's no police there and there's just people there, right? And, and some people say, well, why are people doing all of this? Well, let me just say this. I'm so thankful for uh, Stacy's admonition today because, see, there's times we don't get all of the answers to the questions that we have. And as such, we can become uh, bombarded uh, with the issues and become hopeless. You know, there's a, a scripture that says hope deferred makes a heart sick. And it really does. Uh, when, when our hope is deferred, our heart is sick. And I'll tell you this, that people handle a sick heart differently. When you are hopeless, uh, sometimes you just give up. Sometimes you, you, you don't think anything can happen, but I like the balance of that scripture. Hope deferred makes a heart sick, but when a desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. And so I am hopeful that this time that we are in, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will make us better. I'm hopeful that uh, change will occur. I'm hopeful that uh, you and I will be able to see the change occur. And I'm like in my, my latter half of my life, I'll say, and I'm hoping that I have an opportunity to see some of the change that I believe these times that we're living in right now will bring about. You know, uh, I like to read this from Parade Magazine. This, this story comes in, and it's such a, an encouraging story. Uh, the, the story is a, a self-made millionaire, Eugene Land, who greatly changed the lives of a sixth grade class in East Harlem. Mr. Lynn had been asked to speak to a class of 59 sixth graders. What could he say to inspire these students, most of whom would drop out of school? He wondered how he could get these predominantly black and Puerto Rican children to even look at him. So scrapping his notes, he decided to speak to them from his heart. He said, stay in school and I'll help pay the college tuition for every one of you. At that moment, the lives of these students changed. For the first time, they had hope. 
One student said, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a good feeling. Nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school. See, when you have a hope, you have something to look forward to. You, you, you have something to fix your gaze on, to set your heart to. And I believe that the events that are occurring across the country are an, an indicator that change is necessary. And I'm hopeful as a man of God, a man who trusts God, that we will make it through these turbulent times better than we were before. Hallelujah. I firmly believe that. Why? Because I'm seeking God for that outcome. How many of you out there are seeking God for that outcome? Oh, I am not trusting in man. I am trusting in God. Now, I pray that God will use men, and I pray particularly that he will use you and me and others, but I also know that the heart of kings is in God's hands, and you don't have to be saved in order for God to use you. <laughs> ask Pharaoh. Well, we can't ask him, but some of you know what I'm talking about in that Pharaoh was used by God to let the children of Israel go. However, I believe that there's a way to move the needle of justice forward. I really do. And, and, and I believe the church is the catalyst for that. Let me say it again. The way uh, to move the needle forward, I believe, will be either introduced or underscored by the church. The church is the catalyst. And just like in the 60s, the African-American church was a catalyst and a hub for the civil rights movement. I'm so thankful that I'm not saying it's going to be the African-American church that's going to be the catalyst. I'm saying it's the church at large. Hallelujah. Both African-American, Anglo, Hispanic, uh, Asian. I mean, the list goes on. I believe that God is causing us to come together around some issues as believers and that we would seek his outcome with regards to these issues. Oh, yes. And so I'm encouraged at this time. In fact, I'm blessed that I have an opportunity to serve in a multiracial, multi-generational church. I'm so thankful that it's not one or the other or this or that. Hey, we, we have all kinds of folks in our church. And so this message is for all of us. It's not for a, a group of people. It's for all of us. And I believe that God wants to use you. That's why the, the title of this message, Reconciliation, and it's a question, what can I I do. Well, Pastor Will, you say I, you, you believe that uh, the church is going to be the catalyst. Well, why do you believe that? Well, I, I just want to give you some scriptures to write down. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. It says this, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Everybody see that there? This is what God's heart is. Let's look at Psalm number 10. Look at this. Psalm number 10, verse 18. Look at what it says. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. You see that there? That the man of the earth may oppress no more. Everybody see that there? This is God's heart. Look at Psalm number 37. Psalm number 37, verse 28. Look at what it says. For the Lord loves what? He loves justice and does not forsake his saints. Notice that they are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. So I believe over the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot uh, about uh, justice. You're going to be hearing a lot about reconciliation uh, over the, the pulpits of America. And, and I pray that, well, I'll say it this way, you should be hearing a lot more about justice, about reconciliation over the pulpits of America if those uh, preachers and teachers and pastors are being prophetic. People need a word for now. They need a right now word. And so as such, I believe God is giving us a right now word to help us to understand our role in reconciliation. Help us to understand the process of reconciliation. Help us to understand the goal of reconciliation.
And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians, and I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, and I'll get to a few points here, but I want you to turn it, just keep your, keep your finger in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. Just keep your finger there. We're not going to go there yet, but I want, you to, I want you to be ready. Because, see, it's here in 2 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter, who wrote the book, he's clarifying the purpose of his ministry. There were some that were making themselves apostles, and they were having these letters of commendation from folks. And, and Paul was saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he begins to clarify not only his apostleship to the church at Corinth, in both of his letters, by the way, but he also begins to let them know their role in reconciliation. And so uh, when, you, when you hear the term reconciliation, uh, you'll discover that many people use it for uh, in many ways. And, and oftentimes they're totally appropriate. Oftentimes they're right on point. What I like to do is I like to read to you the definition that comes from the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament because the word reconciliation or reconcile is found in the New Testament uh, primarily. Uh, and it means this. It means to reestablish proper, friendly interpersonal relations after they have been disrupted or broken. Let me, let me read that again. Reconciliation to reestablish proper, friendly, interpersonal relations after these have been disrupted or broken. And see, that's a process. It's not a thing that we do. I, I, I'm reconciled. Reconciliation is realized as the process of reconciliation takes place. Let me say that again. The end result, reconciliation overall, it's, 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 it happens as we go through the process of reconciliation. So I like to share five keys to reconciliation that we discover here in 2 Corinthians. Five keys to reconciliation. And, and I'm going to make these points personal. See, I don't want to preach at you. What I want to do is I want to encourage you. I want the Holy Spirit of God to empower you. And I want you to see your role in this. So I'm, I'm making these five points, if you will, these five keys. I'm putting in the first person uh, 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 the first person point. So point number one, let's look at this together. Point number one, I live for Christ. Say that with me again. I live for Christ. And let's look at second Corinthians chapter five. Look at verse 14. Look at what it says here for the love of Christ compels us. Everybody see that there? Because we, we judge this, that if one died, for all, meaning Christ, and some of you have in your Bible that one, that O is capital, that one died, that's Christ who died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for who? For themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Hallelujah. What we're discovering here in this context of reconciliation, see, first, I have to live for Christ. In order for me to be an agent of reconciliation, in order for me to even have a goal of reconciliation and to be able to fulfill that goal, that that has to, I have to be uh, a man, a woman of God. Now, there are others that may be able to participate in reconciliation that don't know God, but I'm, I'm talking about leadership. Remember, I'm talking catalyst, the catalyst for our nation, the catalyst for our states, the catalyst catalyst for our counties, the catalyst for our cities, the catalyst for our communities, I believe are believers who understand their role in reconciliation. Oh, give the Lord a hand, praise. Yes, yes, yes. So in this regard, he says that we should no longer live to ourselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, let me say this. People are uh, motivated in two ways. I want to encourage you to write this down. People are motivated in two ways. One, they are internally motivated. Uh, they experience or participate in internal motivation. This is to do things that you feel you need to do, to do things that you think to do, to do things that you 
desire. And these decisions to do are based on internal values. Now, let me explain what values are. Values are uh, ways of being that are important to us. These are, these are things that are important to us as individuals, such as uh, honesty. Honesty is important to me. How many, of you, how many of you value honesty? Honesty is a value that you, that you kind of live by and you anticipate that people will be honest with you. Another value, integrity. I, I, I like to operate integrity, and I really appreciate those who uh, value integrity also because that kind of takes care of a lot of uh, things that uh, I don't have to be concerned with, if you will. Uh, I value monogamy in marriage. I, I, I value being with my wife. Uh, we've been married. It'll be 32 years this year, and I'm so thankful. And, and my honey, she's not here today. She's, uh, as I mentioned, she's traveling, and she... She sent me a text this morning, Pastor Will, I'm praying for you and I pray that the Lord will use you and that, you know, that the people of the world, uh, the people on the call will be blessed and that you will be encouraged in your heart. Oh, I love my wife and, and, and I'm a one woman man. Hallelujah. Let me just say that again. I'm a one woman man. That woman is for me. God ordained that way back. He, adored, he ordained it before before I was, but I've been realizing that for at least 32 years, right? And so, so that's a value to me. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to step out of the marriage and, and I pray she doesn't, but she's in control of her and, and she submits to the Lord. But, but see, values are those ways of being that are important to us. And then we make decisions based on our beliefs. Beliefs are what we hold to be true, and they're primarily based on our values. So, so, so if I value honesty, my belief would be uh, people shouldn't lie. Why? Because I value honesty. So therefore, people shouldn't lie. Or, or because I value monogamy, I value being a one man woman, uh, people shouldn't cheat on their spouses, right? So why? Because that's a value that I have, but, but I also believe that. So my value uh, is then, uh, it then motivates my beliefs. And then we also are making decisions based on biases, Biases, yes. And see, biases are shaped by our values and our beliefs. So, so, and, and let me let you know what a bias is. Bias, uh, bias is prejudice in favor of or against one thing. See, it's in favor of or against one one thing, or it's in favor of a group and against another group, or it's in favor of a person and against another person. So, so if I uh, allow this progression of truthfulness, for instance, being, uh, being honest, which is my value, uh, and my belief says people shouldn't lie, well, then my bias becomes liars are no good. <laughs> You know, liars are always scheming or liars, you know, that's a liar. I'm going to stay away from the liar, right? Those who cheat on their spouses have, have cruel, they're cruel and they have uh, evil intentions. See, everybody see the progression there? See, your values will help shape your beliefs and your values and your beliefs will help shape your biases. And that's a reality, ladies and gentlemen. And let me let you know this, everybody has biases. Oh, I want to let you know that some people, oh, I don't have a bias. I, I just see people as they are and I see everything. I'm colorblind. Well, you might be telling yourself you're colorblind. And thank God you may not be responding in ways that are negative to folks, but nobody's colorblind unless you're truly colorblind, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so, so the ways we are motivated, one way we're motivated is internally motivated. Say that with me, internally motivated. So another way we are motivated is we're motivated by external motivation. That's motivation outside of ourselves. And that kind of motivation uh, encourages us to do things others want us to do or to do things that we think others uh, are doing or, or, or to do things because others are doing it. And sometimes we use that word peer pressure. And that word peer pressure, it, it's indicative of someone being externally motivated to do in some cases what they don't want to do because they're but they're being pressured by peers to do that. And see one of the greatest ways that people are externally motivated is through 
enculturation. Say that with me. I hope you're hanging in here. I know I'm, shoot, I'm shooting some words to you, but there's a reason that I'm sharing this. Enculturation. Enculturation. Now hang in there. Some of you might hit the snooze, the, the sleep button. Oh, just hang in there because this is, this is really good. See, enculturation is when a person gradually acquires the characteristics and the norms of a culture or of a group. See, that's what it is. You're, you're being enculture, enculturated when a person gradually acquires the uh, characteristics and the norms of a culture and of a group. And let me just say this. There have been groups in this country that have never seen things from the same perspective. I'm so thankful for the uh, encouragement that Stacy gave us earlier in our service today because she was saying there's some people that don't see eye to eye. And guess what? There's some people who won't see eye to eye. I would love to say, let there be peace on earth. I will say, let it begin with me. But I know that that peace on earth is going to be limited to some degree because some people will never see eye to eye. Does that mean we should not try? Absolutely not. In fact, I believe that God is the one who is the one who determines uh, what happens with those who don't see eye to eye and those who do. In other words, I'm saying that's God's business. I'm going to do everything I can to reconcile or to bring about reconciliation. I'm going to do everything that I can to speak for justice sake or to do things to uh, enhance uh, awareness of justice. I'm going to do everything I can to live as light in the world and salt in the earth. And that has nothing to do with anybody else other than me. Oh, give the Lord a hand, praise. I know, I know, I, I feel you're, you're, you're sensing uh, how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you on this. Look at what it says. So let me, let me, let me continue here. So, so there have been groups that have never seen eye to eye. Uh, what's interesting is I begin discussions with some of my pastor friends who happen to be white and I have been enjoying this discussions. In fact, I was looking at my calendar and I have several scheduled for next week as well. And the dialogue between black and white pastors, it is, it is increasing. Uh, in fact, as you look at uh, your, your uh, social media, as you look at um, YouTube and, and you look at these, these other uh, forms of media that are not directly associated with mainstream media, you will see that several conversations are taking place and guess what? Rightly so. And what, one of the things that I love about the conversations that I'm having is rather than us talking about the congregational issues that we've talked about before, and, and rather than talking about, you know, good self-care and how you're taking care of your family well and, and you know, and pray for me and, th and these issues that pastors bring to one another to partner with one another in prayer, rather than talking about those, you know what, what's, what's going on? They're asking me, hey, Will, tell me about your life. Tell me about what you endure. Tell me about, you know, how, where you were born and, and where you were raised and, 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 and how does race fit in your life? I'm so thankful that these men are, are, are having these conversations with me and I with them because I ask them questions as well. And what we're doing is we're getting a chance to look into each, into each other's lives primarily unfiltered and it's because we trust one another. See, these are men I know. I've been doing these men for some of them for decades, right? And a few of them for at least 10, 15, 8, 10, 15 years. And so because we know each other, we can ask each other these kinds of questions. Oh, I, I want to encourage you, by the way. I know I might be getting to a punchline here or a word. I want to encourage you, have, have conversations with people that are different from you with the intent to learn, not the intent, the intent to judge, to criticize, to blame, uh, to, to cry. L listen to people, listen to their experience, especially if you know them, because you will be enlightened. And so rather than being led by uh, our motivations, uh, being led by biases, being led by our opinions, uh, the, my pastor friends uh, have been asking me, hey, Will, help me see what I can't see. I love that. In fact, I just had another meeting just Friday, uh, excuse me, Thursday. One of my pastor friends, he says, Will, help me see what I can't see. 
because I'm obviously missing something. And what's so good about that is, remember, this is a man of God. He's being led by the Spirit of God to find out what he doesn't know. Rather than, as Stacy said, when we don't know something, just wipe it off the table. When we don't don't know something, just seek not to agree or not to not to understand it. These men and myself are having conversations with one another so that we can seek to understand. Why? Because we have a common denominator. And for those of you who know your fractions, if you have a common denominator, it doesn't matter what the numerator is, it will always work out because the denominators are common. And here we have a, 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 a denominator, Jesus Christ. He's the common denominator. So we approach things from different perspectives. Sometimes it's different different perspective theologically, or, or sometimes it's different perspective in this regard with, with regards to race. But if Jesus Christ is the denominator, it doesn't matter what the numerator is. We can work it out. And so I've been having these meetings and we are enjoying getting to know one another at a deeper level. See, that's what it is. It's getting to know one another at a deeper level. And as such, what happens is biases are being exposed, but they're not being exposed in a, condemn, a condemning way. They're being exposed in a self-identifying way. In fact, one of my pastor friends said, you know what, Will, I've said that before, or I've done that before, not even understanding the ramifications of that to an African-American man. And, and I, in turn, have encouraged uh, my white pastors or pastors that are white, my friends that are white, I've encouraged them to say, hey, you know, what I know that you most likely struggle with what to call us when you decide to call. Do you call us black? Do you call us African American? What what do you call us, right? And so so there's some things, some dialogue that we're having that helps us to understand one another more. Hallelujah. Now, I'm, I'm, I know I'm walking in a landmine, but the Holy Spirit is guiding me and he's leading me. And there's nothing in this message that's meant to offend anyone. It's meant to encourage and to teach us all, right? As uh, someone, some great theologian back in the 90s said, can we all just get along? <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. So, so rather than being internally motivated or externally motivated, Paul introduces this other concept, and the other concept is being spiritually motivated. Hallelujah. Not internally motivated, not externally motivated, but spiritually motivated. So let me read 2 Corinthians again in the context of that we've just uh, laid, the foundation that we just laid. Look at what it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again, verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ does what? compels us. See, he's saying, I'm being in, I'm being motivated by the spirit of God. And in this case, the love of God compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all die. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose, uh, who died for them and rose again. Everybody see that there? So what this does is this introduces spiritual motivation, being motivated, being led by the Spirit of God, being compelled by the Spirit of God, being influenced by the Spirit of God, being filled by the Spirit of God. See, that's not a, a man thing. This is a God thing. And this is why I believe the change that's necessary in our country today, it has to come from the church because God is the one who will give us the ability to not operate from intrinsic motivation, not operate from external motivation, but operate from being motivated by him. Hallelujah. Motivated by the spirit of God to do what God wants to do here on earth. Remember Jesus taught us. He says, uh, when you pray, pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as such, we are learning that God through his Holy Spirit wants to use us to, to manifest his will or to work his will on earth 
as it is in heaven, knowing that it is God who works in us. See, there it is again. It's not willpower. It's not, I'm going to be good enough. I'm going to be smart enough. I'm going to be wise enough. I'm going to be eloquent enough. No, it's God working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure in your life. Oh, I, I hope you praise the Lord with me on that. See, that releases the burden from us to have to know everything, all we have to do is hold on to his unchanging hand, get into his word, read the Bible, pray with him regularly, allow him access in your heart. And as you do that, he begins to do what's necessary to move you in the direction he wants you to go in. He gives you gifts. He gives you ability. He abilities. He begins to use you in ways that you didn't even know you would be used. Use you in ways to bring about in this particular sermon, bring about reconciliation, bring about change, bring about establishing connections, bring about having conversations. God will use you to do that. Oh, hallelujah. So the title of our message, Reconciliation, what can I do? Well, I hope the Lord is kind of giving you some ideas right now as you are hearing from him. So, uh, so, so from this new motivation, from this new motivation, this this, this new perspective. See, we, we no longer live to ourselves, but we live to God. And as such, there is a new motivation and there's a new perspective. And it's through that, that truth movement can take place. True change can occur. So number two, the, 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 the second key that I'd like to share about reconciliation, and this is an I statement. I see people through God's lens. Everybody see that there? Say it with me. I see people through God's lens. Now look at what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now we're just going down to verse 16. We read verse 14 and 15. Look at verse 16. Therefore, why? Because I'm not living to myself, but I'm living to Christ, right? Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Oh, look at that. He says, right now, we no longer like, like see people based on who they are. And he goes on to say, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, at one time Christ walked the earth and the apostles knew Christ because he was demonstrating God on earth. Christ told his disciples, when you have seen me, you have seen the father. But we know that Christ then ascended after he raised from the dead, he eventually ascended into heaven and we don't have him in person anymore, so to speak, but we do have him in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And so Paul is saying, okay, so from now on, since we no longer live to ourselves, we're no longer motivated by our biases. We're no longer motivated by our opinions. We're no longer motivated uh, by other biases and in in opinions, that's external motivation. We're no longer motivated by that. We're motivated by God. So he goes on and he says, so therefore we don't look at people as they are flesh or we don't judge them. Oh, praise God. Even though we have known Christ in the flesh, yet we know him uh, no, uh, yet now we know him no longer. We, you and I should have a godly view of people rather than that biased view of people. Oh yes. See, we should have a godly view of people rather than what your upbringing may say, may have said, or, or, you know, your family or, or maybe your community or, or your surroundings or, or your, your, you know, your, even your church. See, see now what happens here is the gospel of Christ and your faith, it transcends these external motivation uh, items, for lack of better terms. And now you're seeing things through God's lens. You're seeing people through God's lens. Now, some of you will say, well, Pastor Will, how do I do that? Well, I want to encourage you. First of all, you got to get into his word. And I've just shared some scriptures early on in the sermon that let you know what God says about justice, right? If you want to know what God says, I encourage you get a concordance. Get a concordance. A, cor a concordance is a book that uh, a book of words and places where they're found in the Bible book of words and scriptures, get a concordance, look at what God says about certain things and search the scriptures to see what he says. I want to encourage you to do that. I, 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 
I, I want to equip, especially Impact Church. See, I'm your pastor. I'm doing everything I possibly can to give you what's necessary to make decisions that are godly decisions based on what God says and not based on what the culture says, not based on what people around you do. You want to know what God says. And that means getting in the book. Hallelujah. <laughs> that means getting, maybe even getting a, def, a, a dictionary out and, and, and reading the definition of words that you find in scripture so you can have a deeper understanding of what that means. So I want to encourage you. Now, one of the things you'll find out about God is God loves race. He does. He loves the human race. <laughs> In fact, there's the, technically there's only one race and it is the human race, right? Then now there may be tribes and divisions and sex and, and schisms and that, but there, there, there's the human race. That's it. And so you will discover that God loves the human race. Did you know that God so loved the world? that he gave his only begotten son. There it is. He didn't say, I love a group of folks. He didn't say, I love a kind of folk. He didn't say, I love a folk that makes so much money or I love a folk that has academic uh, success. He says, I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son that whoever does what? Believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that whoever is not qualified either. He didn't say, well, if you if you are a church goer, if you're not a church goer, if you're born a, a, a Christian or if you're born an atheist, if you're born this or born that. No, what he's saying is whoever hears, whoever hears and responds and believes. That, that's who he's talking about. And there's no qualification on that. There's no human, let me say it that way, there's no human qualification on that. God says he loves mankind. Oh, he loves mankind. I hope you're getting this. I hope this, I hope your lens is becoming God's lens, right? So God, God loved the human race. He so loved the world. So what I want to encourage you to do, seek, seek to have conversations with people different from you. But, 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 to learn, to know, as I mentioned before, find out what their experience is like. Find out, you know, why they uh, have done what they've done or why they think the way they think without judging them. Don't, don't, don't have like someone open up to you. You know, I really, I really thought, you know, people were this and there's times that, you know, uh, even behind closed doors, I, I would say this about a race or I would say that about a race and they're opening up to you. Don't judge them. Well, why would you say that? No. <laughs> If that's how you feel, it's not time for you to have that kind of conversation. Let me just keep it real. You want to allow the Lord to temper your heart and you be guided by the Holy Spirit to learn. See, uh, the, uh, the Bible tells us that God has given us a tongue of the learn that we may know how to speak a word to him in due season to him who was weary. So let us learn before we speak. Let us learn. And, and, and even you might have to put your poker face on because you might hear some things that you say, well, I didn't know they thought that way. Or I didn't know he felt that way. And, and don't judge because then you run the risk of taking what they're saying and filtering it through your bias and filtering it through your opinions and filtering it to, through your experience. And you run the risk of missing what God wants you to get from the conversation. Oh, hallelujah. This is good stuff to me. Whew. Number three and the five keys of, of, of reconciliation. Number three, I develop a new perspective. Number three, I develop a new perspective. Look at second Corinthians chapter five. Now we're going to look at verse 17. Look at what he says here. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Oh, there it is. Now, I know when I read that scripture, let me see the hands of you who've quoted that scripture. You've memorized that scripture. You've, you've heard that scripture. You say, oh, yeah, if any man. Now you understand at a deeper level the context of that scripture. See, he's saying we no longer look at people the way we used to look at people. Why? Because primarily I'm born again and I'm living to please God and I'm living to allow him to motivate me, excuse me, him to motivate me rather than uh, my biases and my opinions and, and my thoughts. No, because my thoughts are not his thoughts. 
His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. And therefore, I'm trusting in my God. Why? Because I'm a new creation. I'm new. Therefore, I should have a new perspective when it comes to people in the earth. Oh, hallelujah. I want to, that's a Selah moment. I want you to rest on that for a minute. See, because if I'm a new creation in Christ, I'm no longer motivated by my desires, by my thinking, by others' desire, and others' thinking, I'm motivated by my God. And as I'm motivated by my God, I seek his perspective in everything. So I want to encourage you to do this. I want to encourage you to challenge old biases with the word of God. Challenge old biases because they'll come up. They'll even come up during this time. Some of you are having conversations with yourself and that's good to have. Well, not with yourself, but amongst one another. Let me say it that way. If you're talking to yourself, that, that's another sermon. But <laughs> many of you are having conversations amongst one another and that's good too. And as you're having those conversations, think about that. Think, think about what you're saying. Think about some biases that you may discover, especially after hearing a sermon like this that lets you know that everybody has them. See, so what you want to do is you want to begin to identify those, begin to recognize those, and then begin to submit those to the authority of Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God. Find, discover your bias. Admit that, you know what, I, I, you're at, I used to think that way, or, or I've said those kinds of things, or I've, I've done other things that people do uh, as a result of race, and, and you discover that, I want to encourage you to submit that to the Lord. Give that to God in ways you say, Lord, you know what, I'm realizing that how I've maybe been raised, or, or, or how I've been viewing things, or how I've been looking at people, I'm discovering, God, that it's not how you want me to look at people. It's not how you want me to engage with people. It's not even how you want me to feel about people. And I'm bringing that to you in prayer. See, what you want to do is you want to bring those things to the Lord as you discover them. Bring, bring your old view of people to the Lord. Bring everything to the Lord, and let the Holy Spirit begin to teach you how to move forward with a new perspective. Hallelujah. I like newness, by the way. I, I like change. Some some people are, are don't like change. Some people are afraid of change. I like change, especially when I'm believing that it's good and it's going to bring about some 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 things that are, are ad, uh, ad, adventurous. I'll say that. Bring about some things that are adventurous. I like change. And so God is saying, hey, you know what? I want your new creation. You're a new creature. Old things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I want you to, I want you to hold on to where I'm going to take you because I'm going to take you to some places that are going to be a, a change for you because you're not at the helm of it. See, that's what God is telling us. There's a, it's a change for you. You're not at the helm, but I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead you and I'm going to give you everything you need for this journey. That's what God promises, doesn't he? So, uh, so number four, Number three, uh, develop a new perspective. And number four, this is the four of five keys. Look at this. Number four, I see reconciliation as my goal. Let me say that again. I see reconciliation as my goal. Look at what verse 18 says right here in 2 Corinthians. We're just going down verse by verse. Look at what he says. He says, now all things are of God who has what? reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. There it is again. Now, now, now what he says is uh, that, that the, the whole dynamic of Christ coming to die, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, you know why he did that? So that we can be reconciled to God. Remember, there was a breach. There was a, a schism. There was a, 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 a breach of our interpersonal relationship with God. Technically, Technically, it was a spiritual relationship with God because when man sinned, he died. And that death was a spiritual death that separated us from God. And when Christ came 
and he was tried and he was tested and, and, and he was tempted and, he, and, and all of our sins were placed on him on that cross and he died as man's representative on the cross. So all of the penalty of death was laid on him. He died, he was buried. And when he raised again, he raised in newness of life. He was resurrected. And, and therefore, even Romans chapter six tells us that we are baptized into Christ at the point of his death, that as Christ died, so did our old nature, our old man, so to speak, that man that was sinful, that man that was led by sin, that woman that was led by sin and didn't know anything about God. And then when we raise again, right, we raise in newness of life because of Christ. And so that dynamic brought about reconciliation between man and God. See, there's a mediator between man and God, and that's Christ Jesus. Christ was our mediator. For those of you who are familiar with court processes and procedures, Christ was our mediator and he, he reconciled us to God again. So the believer is reconciled to God. And what the apostle Paul is saying is, okay, since we are reconciled to God, that's our aim. That's our goal. Reconciliation is our goal because God gave us the greatest example. The quest for justice is uh, my intent. Uh, oh, let me say it this way. My intent for justice, the goal is reconciliation. Not just for justice. I, I don't want just. I don't. I don't just want justice, which I do. By the way, I think we should all. In fact, God wants justice, but justice isn't the end. Reconciliation is the end. See, if justice was the end, then Christ would have died on the cross, and that would have satisfied everything. But He wouldn't have raised from the dead. Why? Because justice would have been meet on him. It would have been met on him, meaning now all of the sins of everyone who believes is placed on Christ and the justice is taken care of. But see, it goes beyond that because Christ rose from the dead to give you and I newness of life. So justice isn't the goal. Reconciliation is the goal, but justice is a byproduct of that reconciliation. It should happen. Why? Because the judgment on man was satisfied satisfied with Christ on the cross, but when Christ raised from the dead and gave us the ability to have new life, then we became reconciled to God. Oh, hallelujah. If I had a handkerchief, I'd be handkerchiefing Pastor Will right now. You preaching, Pastor Will. <laughs> Glory to God. See, that's what it is. That's so, so, so justice for justice sake would have left you and me most miserable because we wouldn't have eternal life. The penalty would have been paid, but we wouldn't be reconciled. The judgment would have been satisfied, but we wouldn't be reconciled to God. The resurrection and newness of life gives us the ability to be reconciled with God. Oh, I hope you're getting that in your spirit today. I hope you get that. And then lastly, so my quest for justice, in my quest for justice, the intent is reconciliation. And then the last key that I'm going to give you, what can I do or what reconciliation, what can I do? Number five, follow God's example. Follow God's example. Look at verse 19. Now we talked about reconciliation. He says uh, that all things are God's, right? And then that is in verse 19, that God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Everybody see that there? Now, now, now somebody might stumble on that word imputing because we don't use that term often in our uh, language today. But that word imputing, even though we may not use the word, some of you do the action. And the impute, it means to keep a mental record of events for the sake of some future action. Now you, 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 you husbands and wives out there, sometimes you, you, you know, you go through something and, and you kind of work through it, but back in your mind, you're, you're, you're storing that you're keeping that so that, so, so that when that, when that happens again, see, there you go again, there, there it is again. See, let me let you know, God doesn't do that. He, he, he doesn't, uh, 
impute our trespass against us. He doesn't hold it against us and store it so that he can bring it up again when we do it again. Hallelujah. See, that's not what God is doing. And therefore, he is our example of reconciliation, not imputing their trespasses to them. Notice this. He's talking about, in this context, Paul is talking about We've been given a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling unbelievers to God again, right? And sharing words that will encourage them to make that decision to make God their God. Therefore, he's given us the word of reconciliation. And so as such, you and I, are agents of reconciliation. In fact, further on uh, in the next verse, he says, therefore we are ambassadors with Christ. See, we, oh, excuse me, ambassadors for Christ. Why? Because you and I have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And let me, let me ask the question in this rhetorical, you don't have to answer it, but I think you know the answer. How much do we need reconciliation now in our world today? Oh, yes. How, how, how much do we need to have these conversations that we're talking about today? Yeah, we do need to have the conversations, but we need to have the conversations with the appropriate goal. And the appropriate goal is reconciliation. However, that's a process. It's a process. It's not a thing that just happens because I had a conversation with some someone. It's a thing that happens as I'm having conversations and I'm learning and I'm growing and I'm submitting my biases and opinions to God and he's shaping me. He's conforming me to the into the image of his dear son. He's uh, being uh, he's uh, growing in me, if you will. He's he's strengthening me and he's encouraging me and he's allowing me to be more of a vessel that is used for peace and instrumental a peace, an instrument of justice, an instrument of righteousness, an instrument that would speak that word of reconciliation to those who need. That's what God's desire is for the believer today. Oh, I pray you get that in your spirit. That's God's desire for the believer today. So reconciliation, what can I do? Well, I pray that I've given you a lot of things to consider that comes straight from the spirit of God and his word that will help you to allow him to move you in whatever ways he's going to move you, to encourage you in whatever ways he's going to encourage you, to, to, to empower you and how he's going to empower you. And I'll just say this. Some of you are verbal. Some of you will be speaking. Some of you are more typers. Uh, typers. Well, you're writers. You're right. Some of you will be writing. Some of you may use art. Some of you may use music. Some of you see God is not limited to how he will use you during this time to be an instrument of peace with the intent of of reconciliation, to be an instrument that seeks justice uh, for the intent of reconciling. Oh, I pray that you were encouraged today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you uh, for this word. You, you've encouraged our heart. Uh, you've encouraged our mind. You, 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 you've spoken uh, at, a, at, a, at a level with, at which we can understand, but, but also at a level that challenges us. Because see, we're all we're all in the same playing field when it comes to biases and our motivations in that, Lord. And, and, and I just thank you, Lord, that you have given us a word to trust you. You've given us a word that allows you access to us. You've even given some of us a way to process what's going on in our society today. Now, now I can, I got a handle on it, Pastor Will. I, I, I see, I see how God may be able to use me or, or I see what some of my next steps need to be. And I'm so thankful, God, that you are choosing to mobilize the church. You are choosing to mobilize believers around this, this social issue. You're choosing to mobilize believers, Lord. And I thank you for doing that. I thank you for the conversations that are being had across racial lines, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the people that are, are talking with the intent to learn and the intent to initiate change, the intent to reconcile, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you are doing. This is a pivotal point in our history as a country right now. Pivotal point, Lord. Use us, Lord. Use us as your instruments of peace, Use us, Lord, as your ambassadors for reconciliation. Use us, Lord. Oh, yes. Use us, Father, 
And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you have given us. Let us stay fixed on you, not fixed on the media, not fixed on groups, not fixed on people, but let our eyes be fixed on you. You say you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Let us, Lord, after the hearing of this message, let us stay focused on you. Let us even review it so that we can get it even deeper in our spirit and search the scriptures to make sure that even what Pastor Will said is so. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we pray, we pray a blessing over our nation that you would move in ways that we've not seen before, that you would encourage in ways that we've not seen before, that you would show yourself strong in ways that we've not seen before because we're undergoing a situation, Lord, <laughs> that we've not seen before. It's reminiscent of things we've seen, but the way people are responding across the world is something we've not seen before, Lord. So I pray in Jesus' name, give your church courage, give your church strength, give your church understanding and more so I pray that you would even add to the church for we know that no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit draw them and Jesus told his disciples I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father but by me Lord God let people find you through Christ I pray Lord that they would believe the gospel that they would that they would I, I just pray for the one that's even hearing me right now Lord they say, you know, I, I hear what he's saying. I, I, I can relate with some of what he's talking about, but I don't, know, I don't know God in that way. I don't know about this reconciliation thing. I just want to encourage you. Uh, seek God while he may be found. He's knocking on your door. Jesus say, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Would you open up? Would you open up to him today? If you say, yeah, I want to open up. I'm going to pray a prayer with you. Then I'm going to go ahead and conclude this portion of our service. So those of you who say, yeah, I want to receive Jesus. I want that, that intimate relationship with God. I just realized that I want to be reconciled when well, that happens through what Jesus Christ has already done. And we, and we realize that, or if you will, or we confirm that through a prayer. And I'm going to pray with you. Father, thank you for the person who says they want to uh, enjoy that reconciliation that comes through Christ pray that you would guide them in your truth. And if you are listening to me, uh, those of you who are praying this prayer, I want you to pray this with me. Dear Jesus, come into my life. I believe that uh, I'm, I'm a sinner based on what you say, not, not how I thought it was, but based on what you say. And, and, and I want you to come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for doing things my way, but now I want to do things your way. In fact, I want you to do things through me. Help me during this time to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. One more prayer, one more prayer for those of you who know Christ. I'm going to pray this prayer for you. Father, thank you for those who know you. Equip us, Lord. Empower us, Lord. Uh, encourage us, Lord, to stand for righteousness' sake, to stand for justice, and to stand for reconciliation. Lord, we're trusting you for this in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you all. Hallelujah.